Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very bites collection, of course, as usual. Um, today, I would like to tell you about a certain type of algebra, which at least from my perspective, always pops up a little bit randomly. So up to a certain point, and I will go, go there, we, it's kind of very natural. The definition kind of makes sense. Sure, it's pretty brilliant, so um, I wouldn't have come up with this myself. But if someone points it out to you, it's kind of very natural. And then at one point, it gets a bit weird. And it's, for me, this is, if you're an expert, the difference between the Frobenius algebra and the Hopf algebra. So they, today we are talking about Hopf algebras, which are kind of really everywhere. Right? So, and that's what I'm going to explain. But they're kind of a little bit different in flavor for me. And it's kind of a miracle that they actually exist. And in some sense, the theorem is then, oh, they exist, by the way. Um, but it's kind of a little bit, well, kind of in, in, in hindsight, because of course they were kind of constructed uh, alongside of examples. But anyway, I'm kind of taking a different approach and I'm trying to discover Hopf algebras without knowing any examples in some sense, um, just by some natural considerations. Let's see how far we can go. As I said, at one point, this doesn't quite work anymore. Um, and that's just kind of where the examples kick in, where the real world kicks in, if you want. And my analogy just falls apart. And that is di different from Frobenius algebra. So for Frobenius algebra, they can be motivated without knowing any examples, essentially. Um, for Hopf algebra, I kind of don't know really how to do it. But we'll go there um, as we go along. So one of the most natural operations we all, all learn very early on is some form of multiplication. So kind of multiplication is, is, is seriously everywhere. Um, not just numbers, but whatever. Uh, my main example, the group ring of a group where the multiplication is just multiplication in the group. Uh, and I would like to draw multiplication in the following way. So A is my underlying algebra, and I draw multiplication as, well, I have this trivalent vertex with two inputs that say A and B, and one output a times b, and kind of a, it's kind of a topological process. And at one point, there's a singularity. Something funny happens, and you get a new output. So I would like to draw multiplication here as this little trivalent vertex instead of like a, like the really multiplication is this type of map from a a to a, and I just draw it because kind of that what happens, right? It just do nothing in some sense, uh, so very smoothly. And then eventually there's a singularity and the world changes and that's multiplication. And you can, so I call this a trivalent vertex uh, for the obvious reason that it's kind of trivalent, I guess. Um, anyway, um, so you can then write down the natural axioms. So associativity, for example, if you just think about it. So this picture here is something like A, B, C, and you merge first B and C and have still your A around. So it's kind of a bracketing like this. And then you go to A, B, C. And the equality says that it's the same as the other way around, where you here first have A, B, brackets, C, and there's so just the same. So it kind of looks like a very natural move. In some sense, you just slide kind of one of the legs across the triangular vertex. And unitality has a, a similarly nice picture. But okay, multiplication is kind of everywhere and I just decided to draw a natural picture for multiplication. So what happens now? Well, okay, what happens is the following. If I look at the picture, it's nice, it's fine, it's great, but somewhat it's asymmetric. So there was some choice involved and it's not quite clear to me at this stage why there should be a choice anyway. And the choice is, for example, uh, why didn't I just draw it the other way around? Why didn't I go from one input to two outputs, right? So why not? From this kind of little bit of diagrammatic approach, it makes completely sense. Like I can just turn my picture, I can just turn my head and everything just goes through. And that's the idea of the what we call co-multiplication. So co-multiplication is really just you turn your head. Okay? So you just turn your head and you do the same. Um, and it's called co-multiplication. It doesn't really matter how it's called. It could be called turned multiplication or turn your head multiplication or whatever. But but I hope it's kind of clear what I'm trying to say, right? So the, the topological picture, it has 
it has no reason to look like what it is. There's another choice, which is equally natural. So there should just be a multiplication. There should just there should be a flip multiplication. And all the axioms just flip over. So this axiom just flips over. And I just really flipped the picture. I should have flipped the algebra as well, but I just flipped the picture. And you have a similar axiom. And everything just works in exactly the same way. And we just discovered the notion of a co-multiplication with the, the usual axioms that you would have for multiplication as well, just flipped over. And indeed, you can write down examples of such. So our little group algebra, again, has a co-multiplication. The co-multiplication, just have a look at the picture, should take one group element that should produce two group elements. And the kind of the only really natural way of doing this is just putting it something like this. So um, the tensor symbol here is just uh, for the two copies. So the little funny symbol in the middle is just saying that it, the, the, one of them lives in copy one and the other one lives in copy two. Okay, so we just discovered the core multiplication by just turning our heads. Fun. Uh, multiplication is, of course, everywhere, and you will notice that co-multiplication is everywhere. It's a bit of a more complicated concept because I guess the only really reason it, it's completely symmetric to the other one. It's kind of the dual of the other one. So co-multiplication is not better nor worse than multiplication, but somehow we are biased to think about multiplication because kind of the natural numbers have a nice multiplication that we're used to. So, and we're not then not thinking about co-multiplication, but life could have been completely there with the opposite way. And we would talk about co-multiplication all the time because it really is the same. You just turn your head and yeah, that's it. And yeah, fun. So here we go. I, I think that's very natural. Just turn your head and you discover co-multiplication. And then you almost discovered what a Hopf algebra is. So Hopf algebra is essentially just an algebra with a multiplication and a co-multiplication. But that's not quite it. There's one extra object, which is a bit obscure, but maybe not too much. So let's have a look. There's this extra object called the antipode, which I will draw like a little uh, dot on, on a strand. And it really just goes from A to A and does something to an element. So first, let's look at an example. My little group algebra um, has an operation that goes from, from itself, but it's just an endomorphism of itself which just takes G to its inverse. And so I can just denote that graphically by this funny dot symbol. And I think that's very natural. And I assume that it's invertible. So how do I denote the inverse? I just put a symbol as well. Now it's a minus symbol. And I just have the rules of whenever I see a plus and a minus, they just cancel out. Sometimes I will assume that it is of order of order two. So these two are the same. Some people would assume that. Um, maybe not a really perfect assumption, but it makes the diagram calculus better. And then you would just draw a dot here, and this is the same as this, and you would have a relation like two dots on a strand is doing nothing. And this is really just, if you think about it, it's just taking a G, then you go to G inverse, and you take the inverse of the inverse, so the inverse of the inverse, which is, of course, G itself, so you have done nothing. So you have this funny operation which kind of mimics inverses and okay fine it, it's the decoration on a strand it kind of makes sense the only kind of really strange thing and i don't have a really good motivation for that is the funny relation you get uh that it's supposed to satisfy with the unit and the core unit so the unit and the core unit in my notation are just these ending strands why is that let's go back to the first picture well what is the, what is a unit of multiplication so 110 times a is a so I should somehow need to get rid of the one, but I have two strands here and it just ended. I just close it and I remind myself as dot, then I close it up. And turning your head gives you the core story. And then there's this slightly funny relation. Um, and I don't have a really good uh, motivation for that one. It turns out that zillions of examples satisfy this relation. That's how it turns out. But anyway, you can now wrap up the definition of a Hopf algebra, and it's not so bad. Um, I just put it here on uh, one slide, just changing because everything here is stolen, slightly changing, uh, all the pictures are stolen, slightly uh, changing the notation for the antipode, which is now instead of a plus and a minus, we can also do a white and a black dot, and they satisfy uh, the same relations. And then you get kind of the natural relations. So multiplication, of course, sorry, co-multiplication, those relations, 
And then you have the funny interaction relation, which I kind of suppressed a bit. So if you these relations define what is called a bi-algebra, and it looks slightly strange, but it turns out that's what you need to do. Fine, but you can just think of it diagrammatically. And always keep in mind that the group algebra is an example. And then the antipode satisfies this relation, which I think is, is really natural, just an invertibility. And the other one, which is a bit, well, it just happens to appear in uh, all in the examples. And the theorem is that these beasts exist. It's not quite clear from the construction here. I mean, you have a bunch of relations. Um, it's not quite clear that they exist. And it's certainly not quite clear that there are many examples of that type. But it turns out that there are actually many examples. So in some sense, these relations are quite um, natural relations to impose on a multiplication rule. Um, and, and really, seriously, just if you open Wikipedia, you will find like, like a trillion of, of, of uh, examples, which I not don't have time to go through. It's just the end of the video anyway. So I encourage you to just open the Wikipedia page on hop for algebras, and you will find a large list of examples. Um, one of them is our group algebra, of course, but there, there are many, many, many more examples. Let's rather go back to um, the, the picture itself. I enjoy this, looking at this. So part of it is very, very naturally motivated. You just take multiplication, turn your head, you get co-multiplication. Why not put both together in one structure? Then you get, um, if you look at examples, you get this block of relations, right? This is really just multiplication, the turn you had, multiplication, and then putting them together. So you need some comp compatibility conditions between the two. And I just wrote them down here. And then there's this extra operation, which is kind of an inverse, and it satisfies the inverse condition, which is which is very nice, and a slightly obscure condition. But okay, fine. That's what happens in um, examples. Anyway, so the theorem is you will eventually in your life see a Hopf algebra somewhere. It might not be called a Hopf algebra, it depends a bit what type of um, situation you study, but they are, for example, very prominent in uh, combinatorics. A lot of combinatorial structures have a Hopf algebra structure, um, essentially just uh, because co multiplication is usually doing something of the form taking something and splitting it in all possibilities. And splitting in all possibilities is kind of a natural operation in combinatorics. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.